Okay. So. <clears throat> Should we do some improv to warm up? <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, you want to do some improv? What do you want to do? Yeah, I'll say a word, and then you guys have to say the first association. But you have to say it, like, literally the first association. Okay, okay. so apple. Caught. Banana. Uh, a boat. Fishing. Naked. <laughs> what? Shower. Naked. Towel. <laughs> well, now I've got naked in my head. I've got to put naked in my head, and then I have to try and get that out. Beach? Yeah. Sand. Suntan. Okay, great job, guys. <laughs> Yay! Oh, my Yay. God. We crushed that. That is totally going in the podcast. That is not all for record. <clears throat> Welcome to Blind Spot. I'm Steve Redden. I'm very lucky today to be joined on the show by two wonderful guests, Jennifer Acker and Naomi Begdonis, who are here to talk about humor and business. Jennifer is a behavioral psychologist, author, and the General Atlantic professor at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, where we are here today. Her research focuses on time, money, and happiness. She was unanimously voted the least funny person in her family. I never think that that's fair in your bio because I read your Christmas cards and they're actually surprising. That funny. is a work of art. Yeah. That takes two to four months to write <laughs> um, and requires, you know, glasses of wine, deep thought. Um, so I would say it's not a natural, organic act. <laughs> her Christmas cards almost kill her every year. Yes. It's like a wonder that she makes it out alive. Correct. I mean, the, Christmas cards. the one thing that is amazing about your Christmas card is I've always wanted to write one. And then I read yours and I was like, I just do not. I'm never going to muster the energy to do Oh, this. my God. But you do it so seamlessly. You just send uh, Naomi and I these pictures of your kids crying. <laughs> and then we're on the floor laughing and you don't need to do anything else. That's That's possibly true. Maybe I'll just do that every Christmas. We're going to do an anti-Christmas card, which yeah. is just that with everyone screaming and having and a bad done. time. And then done. Elegant. <laughs> uh, Naomi Bagdonis is a lecturer in management at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. Naomi designs and facilitates immersive workshops for groups of executives. She is trained at Upright Citizens Brigade and BATS, worked at IDEO, and has been making SNL-inspired shorts in her living room since before she could lift the VHS recorder. She has since built Muscle Mass. Jennifer and Naomi, welcome to Blind Spot. Thank, Thank you. you. I want to talk a little bit about your GSB class, Humor and Business. So I was lucky enough to attend the first Humor and Business class. Uh, I was lucky enough to attend while I was a student here. And you guys were building it in flight. I must say it was a fantastic class. But tell me a little bit about it and tell me why you wanted to start doing Humor and Business and teaching business school people how to be funny. Well, I was teaching a power um, of story class. And I had Naomi guest lecture uh, for one session a few years back, and it was actually a session around sort of teams and cultivating empathy. But what happened in that guest lecture was she had the group just on the floor laughing because the way in which she designed it just made humor kind of spill out of it. So even though it was in service of understanding how to leverage story and data to lead, it ended up being um, surprisingly hilarious. Um, and then she planted this seed that kind of grew, which was, what if we created a session around humor? So the next year, she did two sessions, and one of them was around cultivating humor. And then the next year, we said, well, why don't we just make it a class? Mm -hmm. And that was the shit show that you experienced, <laughs> which we love very, very dearly. <laughs> yeah, Naomi is surprisingly funny. Yes. I think uh, that, is, okay, that is an accurate way to... Not this feels like a terrible setup for a podcast guest. Naomi, do you have a joke prepared? Is that uh, are you going to be funny oh. today? Can you can you be funny on command? No, I, get a, I will be heartless. I will be completely heartless and sterile on today's interview. I uh, I get a lot a hard time in the office for being the dad joke guy because I've now just lent into the idea that I tell dad jokes a lot because I find them in incidentally funny. So that's that's my current shtick at the moment that I'm playing with. Have you, okay, I have a question for you, Steve. Have you always been a dad joke guy, even before you were a dad? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. My dad was just the absolutely quintessential dad joke guy, and he always thought he was very funny, and I found that funny. So I think, I think it is possible that at some point I tried to be 
more sophisticated in my humor, and I've now just gone back to my wheelhouse, which is a, a good dad joke. Did you not want to have kids and decide, I have to have yeah. kids because <laughs> right. I only have dad jokes? That's right. I, was I like, have to justify yeah. that sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. I was like, if I can have kids, I can pull up dad jokes and the dad bod at the same time. It's a two for one. It's so good. <laughs> Yeah, there are lots of advantages to having kids. And I like sort of animated cartoons and all the geeky <laughs> nerd stuff, so I get to do that. I'm currently watching Star Wars with my daughter, which is one of the funnest things that's ever happened to me. So so I guess why I'm interested in talking about this is some people, I guess, use this effectively. But why do we think this is important? Like a lot of business leaders are not interested in being funny at work. They sanitize as much as they can because they think the risks associated it, with it. But, I mean, I, I would suspect that you two think that that's wrong and we should have more humor at work. Yes? Yes. So I, I, was, a, I was a culprit of that for many years. And I, I actually spent a good portion of my career leading what I would call sort of a double life, where in business I had this – I had a belief that I had to have a certain level of put-togetherness and professionalism and seriousness in order to be taken seriously. And that – you know, came forward as me trying to be perfect and me trying to be completely controlled all the time. And I remember at one point I had a client who said to me, you know, Naomi, I bet I know exactly what your Friday night looks like. I bet your Friday night is watching History Channel documentary reruns and re-ironing the clothes in your closet. <laughs> Like, not just ironing, but re-ironing the clothes in your closet. That's and meanwhile... A, that's a sick like, you know, <laughs> Right. And meanwhile, in my DVD player was, like, Arrested Development, and I was, you know, wearing banana costumes with my friends and, and bike riding across the Golden Gate Bridge. And I, I just had this realization of, like, wow, I am a completely different person at work than I am in my in my personal life. And I, and I sort of lived with that dichotomy. And then for me, at the same time, I was... I was taking improv classes in my free time. You know, I was nights and weekends. I was going to improv and I was doing some comedy writing. And uh, and this all stayed pretty hush-hush because I, I figured, you know, when people think of transferable skills, they don't necessarily associate comedy with being at all useful in business. Right. And then I actually started, I started working with, with executives and I had this one moment where, you know, I was standing up in front of the room with a, a bunch of, you know, actually a, a room full of men who were probably 20 to 30 years my senior. And one guy kind of started giving me a little bit of a hard time. He asked a question that was sort of poking fun at, at something that I was talking about. And I sort of jabbed back at him with, with something really, <laughs> I remember it was actually a, an inception reference. Right. He said something like, well, are you going to teach us how to mind read? <laughs> Because I was talking about empathy and how to read other people, and I said, um, and I said, great question. Actually, uh, Inception is the next class that I'll be teaching, and you could just feel the power dynamic in the room shift. Like it wasn't right. a good joke, right? It was right. a it was a super lame Inception joke, <laughs> but the power shifted in the room significantly. And and that guy who had said that to me, he leaned back and he said, "I really respect you. Continue." And so that for me was sort of a realization and led me down somewhat of a path to try and emerge these two, um, these two selves. I wonder, I just want to double click on that for a minute. I, I'm interested in the idea that, that maybe the inclination, or I, I guess I'm asking the question of whether the inclination to be serious is also combined with being a young woman in the workplace and the power dynamic of that and wanting to be taken seriously. And that actually maybe the opposite is true, that humor is somehow seen as more powerful in that specific example that you gave. I think that's illustrative, no? Yeah, it, it depends on the kind of humor. So what we find is self-deprecating humor can be actually power enhancing when you're in a position of high status, whereas self-deprecating humor, if you're in lower status, can actually decrease your, um, decrease your status in a group. And so especially for women, this is something to keep in mind because women – more so than men tend to lean on self-deprecating humor. Mm. So it, it sort of, it depends on the context, the power dynamics, and also the type of humor that you're using. Yeah. Um, and can we, I mean, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about sort of the idea of punching up versus punching down. I think that's a, that's an interesting, uh, interesting thing just to talk about in terms of power. Do you want to kind of just unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah. So the, the general rule in um, the general rule is never punch down. And that is thinking about 
what your status level is in an organization, thinking about the status of those around you, and then the general rule is make fun of someone who's of the same status as you or or higher. And of course, the safest place to go is always to, to make fun of yourself. Now, if you don't have a relationship with a CEO in your organization, you probably don't want to poke fun at him or her publicly. <laughs> but if you if you do have a relationship, showing some banter, showing some a little bit of poking fun can actually be power enhancing to both you and the, and the CEO because it shows that he or she can sort of take a joke um, and roll with it. A good example of that is Dick Costolo and April Underwood. So they were together at um, Twitter for mm-hmm. quite some time. And April is a female and Dick is a male. And the banter between them was A, um, infectious. B, it really, I think, shed you know, a positive light on both of them. So I think it, it you know illustrates Naomi's point nicely. That's really interesting. So one of the things that I think people struggle to see is – um, good examples of business leaders that actually use humor in their organizations or, or ways that this is effective. Do you guys look at anyone and you think like, hey, that guy is really doing it, that guy or, or female leader is, is really nailing humor, or is it as rare as people think it is? Well, one of the things that Naomi and I did before teaching the class is we actually started interviewing leaders and comedians and people who are in the business of comedy to understand, A, their sense of humor, how they used humor, and B, um, also their kind of humor heroes. And one of the things that was interesting while we were interviewing, gosh, I don't know, 50, 60 different leaders and people that leverage humor well is that um, Obama is often referenced as someone who uses humor so incredibly well, Mm. um, not only to increase power, but to diffuse tension and to cultivate kind of this culture of um, not camaraderie, but some levity. Uh, But there's other other leaders that use humor in different ways. Like even, even Elon Musk talks about, you know, I want to die on Mars, just not on impact. Right. So you kind of have that geeky humor, which I yeah. assume uh, surrounds your culture. Uh, but you have Richard Branson or you have, you know, even Oprah or Sarah Blakely who leverage humor in really interesting ways, all of it with different types, um, but all of it, you know, pretty strategically as well. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that another another way that leaders can use humor, you know, you, you don't have to be a comedian yourself. You can appreciate that humor is important and then elevate people in the organization who are good at doing that naturally. So we, we talked to one CEO who um, is not naturally funny and is not comfortable using humor. Um, but what she does is she identifies what she calls culture bearers in the organization. Mm. And a lot of times these are people who are really funny who, you know, naturally do good-hearted pranks in the office and, um, you know, will we'll create funny videos and their free time and things like that. And she actually, as part of their talent review, talks to them about being culture bearers in the organization, you know, how she sees that being incredibly important. And then she gives them roles, like a lot of times they help her design the all-hands meeting, you know, they... She, she gives them time away from their day jobs to do things like create funny videos in advance of the all-hands meeting or, um, or memos that will go out to the whole organization. Yeah, so, that, so that's something we see, too, is it, mm. it doesn't need to be – you don't have to be a comedian yourself. If you value it and you recognize the importance of it, you can also elevate other people. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. And I think that's helpful to leaders specifically who worry about like, hey, I'm not funny and I can't be funny. It's like there are other ways to incorporate humor and levity and lightheartedness into an organization, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Even laughing. I have one other- right. oh, Even just in appreciating right. the humor yeah. at the time. Yeah. Hey, Naomi, something I want to talk about a little bit, and it's something I think about daily in my job is just you know, the different types of people that exist within your organization and the different types of humor they like. You ran us through kind of a personality assessment and then, you know, spoke about that. We have a lot of sort of introverted coders and, and you know, so their, their human needs are different to someone who's sort of more naturally outgoing. How do you think about catering humor specifically for different personalities? Yeah, so I would think about it in terms of uh, orientation and delivery. So, um, so for orientation, we find there are some people who are naturally more comfortable, you know, poking fun, teasing. 
bantering, taking someone down, and not at all in a mean way, right? For these folks, a lot of times it's actually it's actually intimacy building to to sort of have some teasing and some banter. These kind of people say that you know, if if I'm teasing you, it means that I actually really like you. That's what I say. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you fall squarely in this in this camp, and that's why um, someone yeah, you fall someone squarely in this camp. someone described it to me the other day that like a lot of people use self deprecating humor, and I use me deprecating humor, like whoever the person was talking. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, so Steve, you would fall squarely into this <laughs> camp of um, so so more of a an aggressive humor style, and then you know on the other end of the spectrum, you see people who have very affiliative humor, so they more naturally will make fun of themselves. They will never use humor that they're afraid will ruffle feathers, which means a lot of times they won't poke fun at anyone else. Um, They'll try and find common situations, common things that people dislike, whether it's the, you know, time, time management system or the difficulty of traveling to whatever meeting they got to. So they'll sort of find common enemies out in the world and they'll poke fun at those things. If anyone is so, having a problem with a time management system, billfortime.com could potentially help them out with all their time management needs. I hope you get, <laughs> so, I, I hope you get a nice little kickback there. It's a shameless, shameless <laughs> plug in the middle of the podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, so, that, so that's one style. And then if you think about, just breaking those on for a minute, if you think about the risks of using each of those styles in business, um, you know, for the, for the more aggressive type, you obviously risk... Um, people misinterpreting that humor style, people thinking, um, getting offended, or thinking that you are trying to take them down in some way. So that can be super risky. And then on the other side, you know, equally risky is is self-deprecating when you're actually in a position of lower power in the organization. So, you know, if you're over self-deprecating, that can actually take away from people's perceptions of your competence. Yeah. The one thing I think with self-deprecating humor as well is that it has to it has to have a ring of authenticity to it. Like I see sometimes people use it when you're like, I don't actually think that you really believe that about yourself. And it just feels disingenuous somehow. I'm interested in kind of, uh, you know, just in terms of the class, like, you know, actually physically teaching people to be funny. You know, you, you do a number of different skills and exercises. Is there stuff that people can do to actually enhance their natural humor ability? Well, the way we structure the class is no. <laughs> <laughs> don't take this class. <laughs> it won't do anything for you. <laughs> Um, well, the way we are, we're very purposeful in the way we design it. So there's these four parts of the class. The first is uh, what we call discover, which is simply getting to actually know your own sense of humor, what you think is funny, who are these humor heroes. Um, and what we find is that individuals basically think they're funny. Like your kids think they're funny. They're probably going to think they're funny until they're teens. And then when they, um, around the time where they enter the workforce, around 21, 22, 23, their sense um, of being funny, their their self-reflection of being funny plummets um, around that time. And so <laughs> you're working in this environment where you basically lost your sense of humor, either because you're efficient or important or you don't want to ruffle feathers. Um, and so as a result, when you take the class, the first thing, it's almost like you know, Alcoholics Anonymous or something, where you come in, you go like, I am not funny. Um, Or at least there's some point, (laughs) there's some point where you have to actually do a humor audit and think again, oh, what were the signature stories where I was funny or I am funny? And what are the contexts where I am funny to get to know your sense of humor? And we have a typology that people, um, you know, sort of a, a kind of a questionnaire that people fill out to figure out what is their sense of humor and better understand what other people's senses of humor are too. So that's a really important part of that first part. Then we go to what we call play, which is where you do these small experiments with senses of humor. So it's not any big, you know, stand up. It's just these small little habits and acts and, you know, scavenger hunts or like anthropology exercises, you know, field missions or secret missions. And then we move to leading with humor where we're actually studying how leaders, CEOs, and others um, leverage humor well, so we can start doing it ourselves. And then we move to Amplify, where you start um, exploring how to create projects or achieve goals um, or or kind of lead with purpose, but also leveraging levity. So it's it's sort of a progressive um, uh, class that that moves you from one point to another. 
Have you used it in your teaching? Yeah. I mean, have you added in any of these? Yeah, things? absolutely. Um, I would say uh, right now, Naomi and I are teaching Rethinking Purpose. And um, Naomi naturally uses, I think, humor strategically. She's the funny one. She is the funny already. one. Yeah. And right. everyone Sorry. has voted her That's the right. funny one. Yeah. But she'll do certain things like actually insert jokes into our slide deck where I'm on stage and then I have to land the joke and she'll just <laughs> sometimes she'll, you know, tell me about it. Most of the time she'll tell me about it. Um, and sometimes she won't, but that's one way of using, you know, levity or humor in ways that are just fun and spontaneous. What yeah. do you think, Naomi? Yes, that's probably my favorite is inserting is, you know, before we before we go into class, after we have all of our content locked down and we know, you know, what is the what is the intellectual journey of the class? We'll actually go back in. We'll read through every slide and think about, okay, how do we incorporate some levity? How do we incorporate something that will make this memorable? Yeah. And I, you know, and and it helps make these concepts sticky as well. You know, if you. We, we say that the, the, the right balance of gravity and levity gives power to both. Um, mm-hmm. And so if you can incorporate some levity, if people are laughing, then they're paying attention and they're, um, and they're remembering things better. Like the other day I was, you know, I was talking about, you know, this problem that we were talking about in business where people take themselves very seriously and they sort of leave their humanity and their personality at the door. And I said, you know, this is something that happened to me here's a here's a headshot of myself around this time and I flipped the next slide and it was a slide of R2D2 um you know it's like a serious topic but having having some degree of ridiculousness and being able to poke fun at myself and say you know I was a I was a robot at this time right and then and then a couple students came up afterwards and were like oh yeah you know that they, they made some mention to that that um that had you know indicated that it stuck with them but yes, I will say one of my favorite parts of class right now is inserting jokes into slides and then watching mm-hmm. as Jennifer gets to those slides and looks back and realizes that she now has to land a joke. Well, I, you guys will be proud. I think I've put in a joke from my twist bio in my presentation to my OPs in two weeks. It's this very serious, stuffy meeting. And I canvassed a lot of people to see if I could <laughs> use humor with our investors and the unanimous vote was no, and I shouldn't do that. But, but for whatever reason, I couldn't help myself. So uh, I have a joke in my slide deck. Okay, which... I have a question. Do you literally just go, hey, I'm thinking about throwing a joke into this deck. What do you think? And they all said, that's a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. basically, I was like, I was like, hey, tell me about the room, because I've never been to this presentation before. I'm like, is it like lighthearted? And they were like, no. no. And I was like, is it serious? And they were like, yes. And I was like, so you think I could use some humor? And they were like, nah. And I was like, okay, let's try this out. <laughs> I think it'll be fine. It's probably fine. Anyway, if I'm back here next year looking for a job, you'll know that it didn't go well. But um, anything? Oh, the one thing I was interested in is, you know, this is a personal thing for me. Do you guys notice any kind of cultural differences in terms of how humor is used in the U.S.? You know, talking about your more aggressive versus more inclusive humor. Does that does that split across countries, do you think? Or how do you guys think about that? Yeah, so we're, we're actually collecting um, global data about people's senses of humor right now. Oh, cool. So in our next podcast, we might have some answers. But anecdotally, I mean, just even look at your sense of humor, you know, yours – Elon Musk. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a little bit geekier. It's more self-deprecating or me deprecating. Yeah. And um and you know, obviously there's um in the United States, there's certainly segments of people that share that sense of humor, but you also have a sense of humor that's reflected in, I don't know, cultural representations like look at reality shows right now. Right. The sense of humor there is very much one of like making fun of other people mm-hmm. and um and very dramatic. But then you get, you know, if you look at Ellen DeGeneres, another very successful sort of show, which is more laugh at life and more affiliative. Um so, you know, I think there's a lot of heterogeneity within cultures, but we are at least anecdotally seeing significant differences across cultures too. Do you think there is some pressure on humor more broadly just with the culture as it is at the moment? Um, you know, there's a bunch of sensitive social issues going on, the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter. Do you think people are more wary these days about saying something that goes wrong? 
I, I, my instinct is yes, we're in a moment time right now where people, um, <laughs> sort of norms have shifted, right. right? And so I think people, especially those that typically land jokes, don't necessarily know their bearings. I, I completely agree with that. And I, and I also would say, I think that this is a moment where humor is particularly powerful to bring light to some of, to some of the, heavier issues in our society and in particular to to some of the false reporting or not in the news so um one of the one of the people that came and joined our class last year was seth myers and one thing that he said about the role of of late night comedy and and sort of the role of his of his show certainly is they're able to sort of call out incongruities and and make and bring light to some of the ridiculousness that's right. going on in the news right now. And there's ca- and there's that, ca- and there's catharsis in that for people, right? Yeah, right, absolutely. right. Yeah, we um, one of the people we talked to was was uh, one of the heads of Cards Against Humanity, who did this incredible movement called Cards Against Humanity Saves America, which is amazing, and you should look it up. Um, and one of the things that that she said was, you know, when people are there's a point at which people get so exhausted by exhausted and sort of brought down by the news that that they're too tired to act or they're too sad to act. And I think that there's power in um, in infusing some levity and sort of re-energizing people to to take action in ways that they that they really care about. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, ladies, that's that's been great. I really appreciated the time today. You were both funny and entertaining, and uh, I just asked the questions. So thank you, uh, thank you so much for being on Blind Spot today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Naomi. Thanks for calling in and not coming to see me. I'm very sad. I hope you, <laughs> I hope you send me a Christmas card. <laughs>